Watching the Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Tune in each week as we study God's Word together. Welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs. I'm so thankful to be with you. We might once again open up God's Word, that we might spend time in the Book of God, and so I encourage you to get a Bible and uh, follow along with us. And take, feel free to take any notes that you'd like to take as well as we study here from the book of Romans chapter 1. It's where we're going to spend the majority of our time here for this study and look in Romans chapter 1 and to study it together, uh, just a kind of verse-by-verse -verse study of this very important chapter. You know, you talk about the subject of the ancient landmark and not to remove the ancient landmark and just to leave the ancient landmark where it is. You know, that is true as the Old Testament talks about it, that is true so far as New the New Testament is concerned. And it's very much true in Romans chapter 1. Because you know Romans, the book of Romans, and, and all the books of the Bible, all 66 books, in fact, are given to us by inspiration. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, verse 17 tells us there that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so we know that these scriptures are inspired of God. And as God had these words written down, and, and various ones wrote, of course, but the Apostle Paul writes the book of Romans, as these books are being written, they are written by inspiration of God. That is, God verbally inspired these men to write what they did. And in so doing, we find here in the book of Romans some very fascinating things, I believe. Because not only is this book a letter written to the church at Rome, not only is this book a letter, an epistle, being written to, to those folks of the first century, but also within these pages and within these verses, we're going to see how that God was uh, setting a stage or was revealing various truths. Those things sometimes that destroyed doctrines, if you will, destroyed false doctrines, even before they had a chance to rear their head, uh, just as well as teaching and instructing folks in the truth. And so you follow along with me, and feel free to open up your Bible and look in Romans chapter 1. And there we're going to study and look at this passage. In Romans chapter 1, it begins by saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by the, his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, and among whom also ye are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, we'll stop right there. In Romans 1, verses 1 to 6, we see several things revealed to us, which I believe are, are quite fascinating. And you look in Romans chapter 1, and there, verse 1, it begins by saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Whenever I read Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, and I read Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, I see how that Romans chapter 1 forever puts to death and forever destroys the idea that we're supposed to call men by certain names or by certain titles. You'll notice here he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Yes, he's going, and he is an apostle, and he is a preacher, and he is uh, one, obviously, who is one who's in, interested in instructing folks in the truth. But you'll notice as this begins, not only in Romans chapter 1, but also in the book of Titus and several other epistles we're going to see where Paul refers to himself simply as a servant. You'll notice it's not the right reverend Paul. It's not the most holy uh, this or that. He does not call himself father. He does not call himself reverend. He does not call himself by those titles which men are so often uh, giving folks, aren't they? He doesn't use that, but rather is Paul a servant of Jesus Christ. And you know, that is very important we see that. Because truly, regardless of who you are, or what your name is, regardless of, of, of what background you might have, regardless of the education you might have, and the Apostle Paul was a very educated man, 
but regardless of the education you might have in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Christ, we are all the same. We are all His servants. And Paul recognized that, and we need to recognize that as well. We are all His servants. Someone has said, and rightly so, that there are two times in life whenever each man or woman is equal. And regardless of life, regardless of where you live, regardless of your position or status in the world, two times in life when you're all, everyone is equal. One of them is at death. Death comes to rich and poor, to the wise and the unwise, doesn't it? So we're all equal at death. And the second time is we're equal as a Christian. Whenever one believes on Jesus as the Son of God and repents of their sins, confesses their faith in Christ and are baptized for the remission of their sins, in so doing, they become a Christian. And each and every one, regardless of station in life, regardless of, of where you live, regardless of your, your name or family background, regardless of your pedigree, all right, regardless of your genetics, whatever it may be, we are all equal in the sight of God whenever one follows His plan of salvation through faith and repentance and confession and baptism as the book of God teaches. When that happens, we are all equal. And here's the Apostle Paul writing to these folks who might have tried, uh, you know, someone else might have tried to, to play themselves off as something great, something that demands their allegiance and demands that they be submissive. But not the Apostle Paul. He says, I'm a servant. A servant of Jesus Christ. Called to be an apostle. Well, who called him? Well, he's called to be an apostle, of course, by Christ. He's called to be an apostle and then says, separated unto the gospel of God. And that is significant. That's significant right there. Because he says, I am separated unto the gospel of God. Later in Romans 1.16, which we will also read in a little bit, he talks about how that there is no other gospel, no other way that one can be saved except through the gospel. So whenever he says, I am separated, Romans 1 and verse 1, it is significant. And I'll tell you why. It is because of the time period in which he lived. You see, in the first century, in that time period, it was not uncommon, of course, Rome being what Rome was. It wasn't uncommon to see many false gods, false idols all over the place. Rome had uh, come to power and had taken over the world there at that time. And among other things, had taken over the Greeks. And in taking over the Greeks and overpowering them, having them now submissive or succumbing to the power of Rome, what they often did was they just overtook a nation, whether it was Greeks or the Jews or Egypt or wherever. Uh, any of those nations around, they would just go and take them over and they would then adopt their various gods into their pantheon. And so all the Greek gods, we're familiar with Greek gods per, perhaps more so than others, they just took the Greek gods and gave them Roman names. So Zeus, okay, became Jupiter. Uh, we have Hermes, uh, he became Mars, all right? And so we see how these various gods, those are just a few examples, there's just various gods that were Greeks and, give, and one time had Greeks and that Greek names, the Romans take them and just adopt them and give them Roman names. And that's what you find all the way through. You find uh, many times this coming into effect. And so what happened was, in the days of Rome, and Caesar, by the way, Caesar himself was considered a god among the Romans. And that became a big deal, especially in the first century and on forward, whenever, uh, as, as the Caesars were called gods, that you, as a citizen of Rome, were expected to worship him. And whenever the Christians refused to do that, then that's where a lot of the persecution comes in, that's where a lot of the martyrs come in, and all of that is because they refuse to uh, submit. They refused to call Caesar a god. They refused to worship him. Now other people were doing that, but these folks, the Christians, refused to do that. They didn't have anything to do with this. And so you look here in Romans 1 and verse 1, whenever the Apostle Paul says, I am separated unto the gospel of God. 
What he's saying is, is I have accepted the gospel. I have accepted what is taught here. And I'm not going along with all the other false gods. And I'm not going along with the, the pantheon of, of gods that, that, are, uh, that, that you could find around in Rome and, and in so many of these other cities. I didn't say I'm not doing that. I'm separated under the gospel of God. That's significant. You see, they lived in a day where you could, quite literally, choose the God of your choice. You could do that, couldn't you? And if you wanted to worship this one, worship this one, and, and so forth, so on and so forth. You, there were just all kinds of gods that you could worship back then. And you could choose the God of your choice. Now, moving forward in time some 2,000 plus years, and you think about our time today, and we've become more sophisticated than that, haven't we? And we say, well, you know, we know Jupiter and, and Mars and, and a lot of those guys, well, we know those were all fake. We know those were all made up. You don't choose the God of your choice. But there's folks today that tell you, choose the church of your choice, won't they? Now, I want to ask you a question. What's the difference between choose the God of your choice and choose the church of your choice? Well, the only difference I see is that in one, they're saying choose any God that you like. In the other one, and in the other case, folks might say, well, they're just one God we believe in. But from that, choose the church of your choice. But in effect, in effect, there's no difference. Somebody says, what do you mean by that? Well, back in the first century, if you said choose the God of your choice, and you did, and somebody might go over here and, and worship this God at, at their particular temple. Or somebody might choose this God, this God, another one on down the line, and go to their very separate temples and worship that God. What happens today? You'll have people gather up, and they'll drive into town, and they'll go here, they'll go to this church, they'll go to this church, they'll go to another one, and to another one, and to another one. All worshiping in different ways. But all in that case, all claiming that they're worshiping the same God. Now, how can you worship the same God and do it a dozen different ways? At least in the first century, at least they were consistent because they said, I'm worshiping Zeus, or Jupiter today. And this one says, I'm worshiping Mars today. And you know, and this one, another one comes along and says, you know, I'm worshiping uh, you know, another one today. I'm worshiping Neptune today, somebody said. And at least that way they were consistent. And folks would say, well, of course, if you're worshiping this God, you worship different ways than we do. You see the, the inconsistent nature? When we ignore Scripture, whenever we ignore what the Bible says, and then try to say, choose the church of your choice, why not just say, choose the gospel of your choice? It would make it just about as much sense. No, we don't want to choose the church of our choice. We want to follow and choose the church of Christ's choice. And the church of Christ's choice is revealed in the gospel of Christ's choice. And here it is in the New Testament. He said, I am separated under the gospel of God. I will not follow other gods. I will not follow other worship type things. I will not worship. I will not follow other man-made uh, creeds and doctrines. I'm going to go by the gospel. That's what we need to go by today too, folks. And whenever I look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, it forever destroys that idea that, that there are different creeds and different doctrines and things that you can follow and all will be okay. That's just not it. He said, I am a servant. I am an apostle and separated unto the gospel of God, verse 2, which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And whenever I see verse 2, I understand how it is that I, there is only one gospel. It was promised by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It was promised by the prophets back here in these Old Testament verses. And folks, you can trust it. And it tells us about Christ. And it tells us about how He came and He was going to, to come and to be that sacrifice for us. That He is the Messiah. And that He does love us and He's made it possible for the kingdom, His kingdom to come into existence, which it did in Acts chapter 2, and the gospel to be spread, which has started in Acts chapter 2 also, and there to go throughout the entire world. That's what we find. And notice here as well what he talks about. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, he said here's what the gospel is about. 
the gospel, verse 1, separated unto the gospel of God concerning his son Jesus. See, verse 3. Verse 2 is a parenthetical statement. Verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection. Whenever I read Romans 1 verses 3 and 4, it tells me two things. It tells me number one, verse 3, tells me that Jesus Christ, yes, has come and he came in from the seed of David. In other words, his humanity. Here is Jesus Christ who came to this world and that he was born of a virgin. He was born of the seed of David, of that family, of that tribe of David. And, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection. And so I see here in Jesus Christ that God-man. Here is his deity and his humanity there together. It's, you know, people say, well, how can, can God uh, take the form of a man? How can, can God be in, in, in man and that type of thing? How is that possible? I want to tell you something. I don't know. But you know, that is one of those things that is stated by God, and it is something that we must believe. Folks, you think for a moment about taking God. Here's Jesus Christ, God the Son. And taking God the Son, and then uh, here who is omniscient, who is omnipresent, and all of this, and my turn, compressing that into one human form. How does God get into man? I don't know. It was a miracle, wasn't it? Here Jesus Christ himself, if he had performed no miracles, if he'd never walked on water, if he'd never turned the water into wine, if he'd never healed a sick person, if he'd never raised anyone from the dead, he is a walking miracle. And here's Jesus Christ, Jesus the Son of God, who has also come through the tribe or from the seed of David, that is the tribe of Judah. All of that wrapped into one. Apostle Paul says, that's what I'm talking about. The Apostle Paul says, that's the gospel I am preaching. I'm preaching about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who did come, and He was here in the form of man. But He's also the Son of God at the same time. He has. He is, he is man and God at the same time. He's not mostly man and a little bit of God, or mostly God and a little bit of man, he is man and God at the same time. Here's a man who, here is one, it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is completely God and completely man. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? Somebody says, I can't wrap my mind around that. That's okay. That's okay. Folks, that's a miracle. You do just as well to explain how God became man as you try to explain how, how Jesus turned water into wine. Now, how did Jesus turn water into wine? How did those molecules change from H2O to the molecular structure of that grape juice? How did that happen? How did the sugar get in there? How did the flavor get in there? How did all that happen when he had water? I don't know. How did Jesus walk on water in a stormy sea? How did he do that? You know, people can do some amazing things today with film and CGI and that type of thing. And you could set up a, a situation where somebody, kind of like the old joke where the fellas jumped out of the boat different times and they'd run, they'd hop across the water and the last guy, they tried to tell him to go and he fell in and the guy said, well, maybe we should have told him where the rocks were. You know, you can, you can get away with a lot of things in movies, can't you? You can get away with a lot of things around whenever the water's fairly still and where you can kind of see where you're going and you might be able to walk on the rocks and make it look like you're walking on the water. Jesus walked on the water in a stormy sea. Now I want to know something. How did he walk that way? How did he defy gravity? I don't know, but he did it. How did he raise the dead? How did he heal the sick? How can God be in man? I don't know, it's a miracle. 
But I'm telling you what that is, the gospel that is preached. He says here that I am separated unto the gospel of God, I separated unto the gospel of God concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about. And whenever we understand that, it forever destroys this idea that there are, that there are, are many philosophers or many uh, people around today, many religious leaders who somehow equal Jesus Christ. You know, there's folks today that like to tell you that all Jesus was was a good philosopher or a, you know, a good person, a good teacher. Some deny Jesus' existence altogether, but those that, will, that, that don't go that far, and of course they, there's so much evidence for the existence of Christ. You know, there's, there's more evidence for Jesus Christ walking this earth than there is evidence for George Washington. I don't know anyone that denies the existence of George Washington. Do you? And yet people deny the existence of Christ. It's, it's crazy. But we find here that not only is it that this Jesus, the Christ, has come, he, yes, he taught folks, and yes, he was a good leader and such, but he's more than that. He's so much more when we get to the fact that he is declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection. And yet one more thing that Romans 1 forever destroys is the false doctrine that says that Jesus was left in the grave. You know, there's folks today that teach that. There's folks that will tell you that the resurrection was not a literal resurrection. Why, they will tell you that this was a resurrection was symbolic. It was a resurrection of his cause. You know, after the apostles had, had been so forlorn and downtrodden and they were so upset and they were depressed and all this over the death of Christ and the crucifixion and all. And then after so many days, why then they start coming out of that and then they start preaching and teaching what Jesus preached and taught while upon this earth. And they say, well, that was really the resurrection. They say that was the resurrection. It was the resurrection of his cause. And the resurrection of what he was teaching. Well, no, that's not true. Is a real resurrection. By the resurrection, His resurrection. That He came forth from the grave on the first day of the week, the third day. Yes. Mark 16 lets us know that. Not only Mark chapter 16, but the book of Matthew. And Matthew chapter 28, and the book of Luke chapter 24. We read it again in the book of John. John chapter 19. John chapter 20, rather. In John 20, we read about His resurrection. All the way through, we see this. So many people, eyewitnesses of His resurrection. And here's Apostle Paul saying, He resurrected. Romans 1 lets us know that. Romans 1 lets us know, when you talk about Jesus Christ, you're not just talking about any old Joe out here. You're not talking about just some guy out here. You're talking about the Son of God. You're talking about the Son of God and the gospel that's preached by the Apostle Paul is his gospel. And it is that good news that will teach and that will bring folks to salvation. And that's what we're talking about. And so, by whom? Verse 5, by whom? By Christ. See, the whom is Christ. By Christ we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Notice that in verse 5. It's by Christ we receive this, he says, for obedience to the faith. How about that? There's a lot of folks today that like to tell us that faith and obedience are mutually exclusive. In other words, you can either have faith or you can believe, but you can't have both. This passage says, for obedience to the faith. Obedience and faith are forever joined together, my friends. Right there in that verse. Among whom ye also are the called of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. To all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To all, he says, who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Who are those saints? Folks, saints are just Christians. You know, we have folks today that try to tell you, like, like to let you think that saints are are some kind of special category of saved people. That is not just the regular old everyday folks 
Why, these are an elite group. These are these saints have done great deeds and wonderful deeds. And, and, in, and in fact, you can find where they have uh, miracles attributed to them even after their death. And you know what? There's not one shred of truth in that at all. That is farthest, the farthest thing from the Bible that you can find. When you talk about saints in the Bible, saints in the New Testament, specifically Romans 1, we're talking about Christians. We're talking about children of God. Those who were called of Jesus Christ. See, they were called. Called through the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 They were called through the gospel. And they're called to be saints. They are saints. And in fact, you find this term uh, again in other passages. Like I said, in other letters that were written here to the various uh, groups to the various ones around, we find folks called saints. They're Christians. That's all that means. In fact, he says here um, that in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 1 and 2, and specifically verse 2, he says, to under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Here they are, saints. What are they? The Christians. They're those who have followed that plan of salvation we've already talked about. Faith in Christ, repentance of your sins, confessing Him, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Rising to walk in newness of life, they are now saints. The word saint is just a... a form of, the, of a word which means to be set apart. And in this case, you're talking about people being set apart for His purpose. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 and says, you people are saints. You are Christians. You are set apart for a special purpose. And I'm going to tell you what, whenever the Lord calls folks through the gospel and they hear that call, and they have followed the plan of salvation so that by their, by their baptism they have their sins washed away. They are then called for a special purpose. And 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us this, that they are called out, called out of darkness and into His light. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. And that's what it is about. That's what we're seeing here. And that's the truth. Now he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. What a wonderful statement. We're coming up on a break. But I want to leave you with that verse and let you think about that. And after we take this break, we'll come back and start at verse 8 and continue through studying this together and seeing what all Romans chapter 1 teaches and what false doctrines are destroyed by a simple reading of Romans 1. And you stay tuned and you stay with me as we study together and follow along and we'll come back here in just a moment and continue in Romans chapter 1. You stay with us. You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Orangeboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit our webpage at www.southside-churchofchrist.com. Join us on Sunday morning for Bible class at 9.30. And Sunday morning worship at 10.20. Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course. And or a subscription to The Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. Tune into our radio program, What is Written, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Sunday on 94.7 WBIO. And continue to watch The Ancient Landmark on Monday at 9 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., 
or Thursday at 11 p.m. And we're back again and want to continue in our study of Romans chapter 1. We left off reading Romans 1 and verse 8. And there we uh, want to continue on with these thoughts where he says in verse 8 that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Making requests, verse 10, making requests if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you for I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. And that's down, reading down through verse 11, Romans chapter 1. And you'll notice here in this section, we see the uh, continued uh, encouragement, the continued uh, uh, compliments being spoken here by this apostle to these good people here at Rome. And he says, I make mention of you without ceasing. I make mention of you in my prayers. And you know that's an interesting thing. As you look at the Apostle Paul, he's told that to the Romans, he's told it to the Philippians, he's told that to the Colossians, he's told it to Timothy and to Titus and others like this, that he says, I make mention of you in my prayers. And what a wonderful blessing that would be to think about the Apostle Paul praying for you. He says, I am praying for you. I make mention of you without ceasing, without stopping. I make mention in my prayers uh, for you. And how wonderful that is to think of those prayers being offered up by the apostle there on your behalf. Well, that's what he was doing for these Romans. He was doing that for them and praying for them. And also, he says, in my prayers, making a request that I might finally come to see you. The Apostle Paul was not at Rome for many years during the time period of his preaching. And in fact, the first time we read about him going to Rome or being in Rome is the book of Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 28. In Acts chapter 28, having been taken on the prison ship there to Rome, he goes through and, and, and makes his way down, or, or up I suppose, up through to the city of Rome. And of course taken into custody at that time there at the last part of Acts 28, and it talks about him being in prison there in Acts 28 and still preaching and, and teaching to those who would come to his prison cell. So he has gone there. In Acts chapter 28, though, as he traveled, we see where he says that we found brethren. He found brethren there at the three fountains, or the three taverns, the three fountains. He found it there at Appii Forum. He found, it, found brethren all through those places. Now, I don't know who it was originally who, who taught those folks. I don't know who it was. The Bible doesn't say. But whoever it was, there were folks there diligent in spreading the gospel and did so even before Paul got there. But Paul has already heard about these folks. He talked about them and says, your faith is, is spoken of throughout the whole world. He says, you're doing what is right and you're teaching, you're showing what is the truth and you're living it. He said, I have a request now that I can come see you. And uh, has asked God to come see him and go, go to see them. And of course, by Acts chapter 28, he does go and see those brethren there, at least for that first time. He goes on and says in Romans chapter 1, That I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end, that you may be established. That idea of being established is that of being, uh, to be strengthened, to be uh, become solid, have that strong foundation and that type of thing, that they may be established. The point is to be established in the faith. Now notice, please, he says, I long to see you to impart some spiritual gift. There's a few things we can talk about relative to that spiritual gift. First of all, we see that Romans chapter 1 forever destroys this false doctrine, this false notion, it says, that you must exhibit some spiritual gift in order to be saved or in order to show that you are saved. In fact, he says here, I want to give you a spiritual gift so that you'll be established, so you'll be strengthened, so you'll have that, that foundation, as we might say, that they may be ready to, to withstand the problems that were going to come. But it wasn't to save them. Those folks have been saved already. It's kind of like over in Acts chapter 8, whenever, Simon, whenever Philip rather goes to Samaria, and, and Samaria... Those of Samaria are taught the gospel. Though a man named Simon the sorcerer, he is taught the gospel. And all these folks, they hear the truth. They believe it. They're baptized. 
Acts 8 and verse 12 says, They heard Philip preaching concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. And so then Simon himself also believed and he was baptized. And so we find that those folks who believed on God and they had, heard, they had heard God's word, so they believed on God. They'd repented. They'd been baptized. Simon himself believed, and he was baptized. So we read that these folks were baptized into Christ. These folks are saved people. They are Christians. They're children of God. They're not called Christians yet till Acts 11, 26, but that is what they are. They're disciples. They are born again. They belong to God. Now, having done that in Acts chapter 8, it wasn't until later, you remember, that Peter and John come down. And Peter and John then bestow some spiritual gifts upon these folks. Philip couldn't do it. Philip was an evangelist. He was not an apostle. It took an apostle to pass along those gifts. And Peter and John coming to Samaria, Acts chapter 8, shows us that that's true. Now, Romans chapter 1, we're reading the same thing again. He's not going to give spiritual gifts to people so that they might be saved. But he's giving them because they are saved. These folks were already saved, having already heard the gospel, having already believed it, and having already obeyed it. They're Christians. They're children of God. And he says, now I want to come and bestow this spiritual gift. So this forever puts to death and forever destroys the false doctrine that says that somehow people have to show they have some spiritual gift in order to be saved or in order to be accepted and that kind of thing. That's not it at all. Hey, these people were already saved. They were already saints. We read that earlier, didn't we? They are already saints. So he comes for the spiritual gift. Now, the next thing is this. What purpose do spiritual gifts serve? To find the purpose of spiritual gifts, then you need to turn to such passages as 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. Did you write those down? Write those down. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it names or describes the spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it tells us the duration of the spiritual gifts. And in chapter 14 is the regulation of the spiritual gifts. And so if you look at those three chapters to understand about spiritual gifts that are talked about and that are, that are referenced not only in Corinthians but Romans and, and the book of Acts and other places. So now these folks, he says, I want to give you these spiritual gifts so that you may be established. Well, a lot of those spiritual gifts had to do with knowledge, didn't it? About knowledge, about, uh, there, was, there, were, there was tongue speaking, but there was also interpretation of tongues. There was prophecies, there was various uh, things like that, the discerning of spirits and all kinds of things like that. Because remember, in the first century, they did not have the completed written word yet, did they? Now, someone like Rome would have had this letter written to them. Uh, Timothy would have had his letters, Titus his. Thessalonians would have had their letters written to them. Colossae, Ephesus, and such. And then those books were taken and combined into one book. They're taken and combined under one cover, see? These are all separate letters, separate books, we would say that are being written, 27 in all in the New Testament, and then they're taken and put under one cover so that it makes for ease of reading like you and I would read them today. Now, when he says here, I want to use this spiritual gift, the spiritual gift was given because they didn't have Bibles. They didn't have, you couldn't go and say, uh, Paul can't go over and say, Barnabas, go get over in the, in the chariot over there and get out 20 Bibles for, for folks. Or, you know, get a handful, whatever it is. Go get two or three cases of them and let's pass them out. You can't do that. So the spiritual gifts were given. And he said, I long to give those to you. Not because you're not saved, but so that you can be established, so you can be spiritually strong. Somebody says, well, that's what I want today. If you want to be spiritually strong today, folks, this is it. This is the Scripture. That's what the Scripture does. That's what the Word of God does, is give us strength. See, that we may grow, 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, how do you grow in grace and in the knowledge if you don't spend time in the book? The answer is you can't do it. You grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when you spend time in the book. And that's what we need to be doing. And so, but as he's writing this at this point in time, then they, need to they needed to have that spiritual gift so that they could understand. They could know what we know now. 
And so we are so much better off. We are so much, we are so greater blessed uh, that we have the completed revelation, that we have the completed word, and we need to be thankful to God for that. He says that, uh, goes on, talks about being established, verse 12, Romans 1, 12, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. In other words, I don't want you to misunderstand anything. I've been trying to get there. I haven't been able to yet. I'm trying to get there now. And he says in verse 14, I am dead, both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. I am debtor to the wise, he said, to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. Here's the apostle who says, I am a debt. I have a debt that I might spread the gospel. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. He says, I'm a debtor to you, and I want to get there, and I want to preach to you, and I'll preach to whoever I can, wise, unwise, Greeks, barbarians, whoever it is, I'm ready to preach. And he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also, just as I preach the gospel to folks all over various places that he's been traveling. For, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You remember earlier on in our study when we talked about Romans 1, 1, and he said, I am separated unto the gospel of God. Here is a further emphasis of that when he says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. In other words, there's no other way you can be saved except by or through the gospel. The gospel is what reveals Christ to us. The gospel is what tells us of Christ's sacrifice and what he did. The gospel reveals those things to you and to me so that we can, can believe that we can follow those things and be saved. Folks, that's what we need to do. That is the point. And so I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Even while the apostle lived in this pantheon of all kinds of gods, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And even when you and I today live in this time period of so-called so political correctness and so-called diversity and so-called so you know, things like that, are you and I ready? Are you ready to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. Oh, there's a lot of nice folks out there that have, have said a lot of nice, pretty words. There's a lot of people that have nice philosophies and such. And, and perhaps there's some folks who, through their observations and types of things like that, may see things that might be helpful in your personal growth. But I'm going to tell you something. There's no one and there's nothing that can equal the gospel. There is no one that can equal the author of the gospel. There is no other philosophy. There is no other word. There is no other doctrine. There is no other uh, system of belief that will save you. There is nothing that will do it except the gospel. This is it. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. It's not a power of God. It's not one of the powers of God. It's not most of the power of God. It is the power of God unto salvation. And it is high time we got back and placed the ancient landmark back where it belongs, respected its place, respected where it belongs, and said the gospel is the power. And if I'm going to be saved, I'm going to be saved through the gospel and in no other way. That's it. There's none other. For therein, where? There. There in the gospel. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. In other words, from the faith to your faith. That's what he's saying. The righteousness of God is revealed from the faith to your faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. There again, living by faith forever joins together faith and obedience. You cannot separate those two things and say, well, somebody's going to have faith and this person's going to have obedience over here. 
Now that's been tried in the past. That's been tried for, from time immemorial, it seems, and yet it is still not true. God connects those two things together. My faith motivates me to obey. The faith that saves is the faith that obeys, and there's no other way around. He says, the just shall live by faith. That's a, a quotation all the way back to Habakkuk chapter 2, but it's still valid right now. And we need to appreciate that forever. It, we find that the gospel it forever destroys that idea. Romans chapter 1 forever destroys the idea that the gospel is somehow ineffective or inadequate to save. Folks, it'll save you. And it'll save you whenever I believe and I do what it says. That's that, that last part. The just shall live by faith. That's what it takes. And it's high time we understood that. It's high time we appreciated that. Romans chapter 1 is, is just full of, of these things. Isn't it? And all oh, what eye-opening truths are found here just within these few verses. But continue to read. He goes on and says that the wrath of God. Now we're kind of changing directions, aren't we? The first part of this letter, Romans chapter 1, the first part of this chapter has kind of been an introduction or a greeting to these folks and to talk to them and encourage them in what they're doing. And to tell them... You know, they need to keep on doing what they're doing. And the apostle says, I'm ready to come. I'm ready to be there because I want to preach the gospel to you. I'm ready to preach the gospel and I'm going to do it and all those wonderful things. Now, he goes on now and kind of changes direction. Now, he says that the wrath of God, though, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, or some versions say suppress, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that, uh, that which uh, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He said the wrath of God is being revealed to, uh, here, and it's over folks who are trying to hold back or suppress the truth. You know, some folks will try to do that. There are some folks who will try to hold back or they will try to suppress the truth from you and from me because they want a following or because they want to have their name in lights, we'd say. They want to have the, the big name. They want to have the respect or the admiration of men and they know they can't have it any other way except through suppressing the truth. He said the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against such folks as that. Don't. Uh, make sure that you do not follow someone like that who wants to hold back the truth. You need to wonder, you need to worry about folks who will not come to you with an open Bible and say, here it is. Let's study. Let's read it together. But folks, that's what we're doing. Just open up the Bible and read it. Let's read and let's study and let's learn from it. Let's see what the Bible says. Here it is, the wrath of God, those revealed from heaven against those who would suppress the truth. Because, he says, that which may be known of God is manifest. For God has showed it to him, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. In other words, the evidence of God is all around. It really is. It? And those who will stop and those who will slow down long enough to look can know that there is just one way. There is a God. There is a creator. And he says the invisible things, he says, from the creation of the world, they are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's verse 21. Keep reading. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. He said there was a time whenever men understood and knew God. He said, but what happened was, after a time, they did no longer wanted to, to acknowledge God. He says, they, uh, not only this, they did not glorify God as God, neither were thankful. He said they became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. And then what happened? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the image of the corruptible God into an image into corruptible God and made an image like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Here are folks who changed and they started worshiping idols. 
And you think about all the different cultures who have worshipped idols over the years. From the earliest days on down to present day, folks still worship idols, don't they? And that's what's so sad. This same man, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, this same apostle Paul would write and tell folks in Colossians 3, 5, that that's part of that verse, that covetousness is idolatry. And so what I learned there from that uh, verse, that covetousness is idolatry, what I learned from that is that, you know what, I don't have to bow down to a stick or a stone or whatever and before it's called an idol. You can make an idol out of yourself. You can make an idol out of your parents. You can make an idol out of traditions or the traditions of men. You can make an idol out of about anything, really. And he says the result or, or, or the reason why this has happened is because folks did not glorify God as God, neither were thankful. They were ungrateful people. They were no longer thankful, appreciative to God for His for His caring, for His blessings, for His creation, for His salvation, for any of that. They weren't interested. They didn't want it anymore. Let me ask you something. How much do you want God? How much do you want His salvation? How much do you want those things? You need to be thankful. We need to be appreciative. We, we, we understand that from a human standpoint. And we feel so, uh, you know, I, I guess we, we feel like we're being acknowledged. Maybe that's not the right word, but we feel like we really made a connection with somebody. When after we gave them something or somehow we offered a, a service or, or something like that to them, and they turn around and they say, thank you. They say thank you. You don't want money for it, perhaps. Uh, I know sometimes folks sell things, but I mean, generally, we're talking about giving something. You know, you're not wanting money back. You're not wanting this. We're not saying I'm doing this so that later on you'll do something for me. But the simple act that they said, thank you. And something about that just reaches down deep, doesn't it? And you think about that, and then you think about in light of what God has done and the creation of the world and all things around us and the blessings and the sending of Christ His Son and all of that. And we can't say, we cannot offer our gratitude to Him. Will we not say thank you? He said these people didn't do it and it became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened and professed themselves to be wise, they became fools and they changed the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. How sad. And yes, that still goes on today. That's what's so terrible about it. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through their own lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God, verse 25, into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to a vile affection. For even their women did change in natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in her lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and received in themselves a recompense of their error which was meat. You know what Romans chapter 1 forever destroys? Romans chapter 1 forever destroys the idea and destroys that false doctrine that says that, that when men are with men in a sexual way, that's what he's saying, and women are with women, that that is somehow normal. It's not. That somehow that's just an alternate lifestyle. It's not just alternate. It is sin. And you look here in this passage and he says they did change the natural use. If they changed what was natural to go against nature, that means that such activity is unnatural. Somebody says, I didn't make that choice. I didn't choose this. God made me this way. If you think God made you this way, you need to read these verses again. God didn't make you that way. You chose it. Somebody says, well, if you think I would have chose you, I would have chose this life. You did. Sometimes the statement, sometimes the, the, the comeback is, well, you didn't choose to be attracted to a woman. Well, that's true. Because, see, that's natural. Okay, 
You see the difference? Because that is natural. He said, now the women with the women is unnatural. The men with the men is unnatural. The work that which is unseemly. They receive the recompense of their error. Error. See that? Error. Not genetics. Error. Not something in the air. Error. Okay? It's not something that, it's not just something that just came on me one day. This is error. Okay? The recompense of their error. And folks can come out of that. And shame on those people who would ridicule someone who has left a sinful lifestyle and has become right with God, whether it is the woman or the man, being once more attracted, and, and rightfully so, attracted to the opposite sex. And then folks turn that down and say, well, there's something wrong with them. They got converted and, and make fun of them. No, that's the truth. They had to turn around. They had to leave what was unnatural and come back to the natural. But I'm going to tell you something. Whenever some people have become gone so long into unnatural situations, that almost seems natural to them. You think I'm making that up? Look back in Isaiah 5. In Isaiah chapter 5 when he said, Woe to those who call good, the good evil and the evil good. Who put light for dark and darkness for light? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? What had they done? They completely reversed the natural things. Light for dark and dark for light? Hello? They changed good, uh, the, the good for the evil and the evil for the good and the bitter for the sweet and the sweet for the bitter. And he says, well, this has happened here, hasn't it? Here's what happened. They have changed from what was natural to what is unnatural. And they think it's natural. But it is error. They need to come out of that. They need to repent. Not only in this passage, but Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, also speak about these sins, these sexual sins, and says folks have been forgiven, but at the same time they had to repent and come out of that. That's what happened because of their wickedness, because they were not thankful. And he continues on listing all these various sins and the things that they've done. And down here he finally says that God had condemned them. Don't be like that. This is a warning, folks. This sounds a warning to you and to me to make sure that we live in line with the gospel. The gospel that is God's power to say, live in line with that and do what the gospel says. Follow it. Live by faith. And we'll be well pleasing in the sight of God. And we will be right in His sight. And you can do it. And I can do it and we all can do it. One day we can see heaven together one day if we'll just believe on Christ, repent of our sins, confess your faith and be baptized and live that life of faith for Him. This Bible teaches you how. This gospel shows you how to do it and be prepared for heaven. We can do it. I'm so thankful for the good way you've listened. So thankful for this opportunity. Thankful for our study. Until next time, we'll be You've been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Tune in each week as we study God's Word together on Monday at 9 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., or Thursday at 11 p.m. The Ancient Landmark has been brought to you by Southside Church of Christ at 2920 New Hartford Road, Hornsboro, Kentucky, 42303.